Basically, I'm going to talk about the um, uh, development and indications and then the technique for implantation for using hypoglossal nerve stimulation for treating obstructive sleep apnea, uh, specifically indicated for patients that have uh, failed CPAP. And let's see. So I don't know how to use this. Oh, there we go. So. Um, First uh, item to address is what exactly is hypoglossal nerve stimulation and why should it work for treating sleep apnea. As I'm sure you all know, the hypoglossal nerve um, supplies all of the intrinsic and extrinsic muscles of the tongue, and specifically the genioglossus muscle. So stimulation of this nerve activates the genioglossus muscle to contract, which pulls it forward, which um, can dilate the pharyngeal airway. Uh, it both dilates it and stiffens the walls of the airway, so it um, uh, addresses both of the fundamental defects uh, that are present in patients that have obstructive sleep apnea. The original work done on this topic was um, started in the 1990s uh, with animal studies that showed that it was possible to produce airway dilatation by stimulating the hypoglossal nerve. In humans, the initial work was done transcutaneously with uh, submental electrodes that were designed to produce enough electricity that it would cross the soft tissue and stimulate the hypoglossal nerve. Uh, initial studies showed that this was effective and they were able to decrease uh, incidence of apnea, but um, further review of the data showed that what was actually happening were that the patients were experiencing painful stimuli being aroused and the uh, apnea was, uh, was being treated basically by waking the patient up. And as I can attest, anytime you're snoring, if you are presented with a noxious stimuli, then your snoring will stop, but you also tend to wake up. The work then uh, looked at using a fine wire stimuli to um, uh, directly stimulate the hypoglossal nerve, and this did prove to be quite effective. Uh, the wire was introduced um, transmucosally uh, beneath the, the tongue anteriorly, uh, produced good results, but obviously is not uh, clinically applicable, so uh, work uh, moved towards stimulating the nerve directly with uh, implanted devices. <clears throat> In the United States, there's um, basically three companies that had been working on uh, developing the implants. Um, the APNEC system um, is no longer uh, being worked on. They had uh, uh, some suboptimal results with their preliminary studies. So I've included the final two. The INSPIRE system uh, did get FDA approval in 2014 and is currently available for use. Uh, the Imthera device, which is produced by Libnova out of San Diego, um, still in um, uh, clinical trials and is not available and probably will not be available for a few years yet. Each company took a little different approach as far as um, uh, the exact system that they were using. The uh, big difference between the Inspire and the Imthera systems are that the Inspire system is um, paced, so the stimulation is uh, introduced uh, to be um, coincident with inspiration. Uh, the Amthera stimulator is on constantly during sleep. It does use an array of six electrodes, so the electrical field is varied throughout the, the night, uh, delivering stimulation to um, specific fibers within the hypoglossal nerve at, uh, at set intervals. So specifically for the Inspire system, since that's what we're working with now, there's uh, criteria that have been developed um, to determine who's a good candidate for implantation. Uh, these were established by the FDA when they granted uh, approval. Uh, so the patient needs to be 22 years or older. There are, of course, um, indications in uh, pediatrics, particularly with Down syndrome. Uh, they need to be diagnosed with uh, obstructive sleep apnea with an apnea hypopnea index of uh, 15 to 65 in, uh, incidents per hour. And they need to have 25% or less um, central apneic events in their, in their apnea hypopnea index. They need to have uh, tried and failed CPAP, uh, meaning either the CPAP didn't work for them or they find it unbearable to use it or they just refuse to use it. And they need to have appropriate airway anatomy, which means that uh, they don't have um, large three plus, four plus obstructing tonsils and undergo um, a um, 
uh, drug-induced sleep endoscopy study to evaluate the pattern of airway collapse. Uh, specifically, um, the indication here is the um, um, airway collapse in the retropalatal region, and this should be uh, what we call anterior posterior collapse, where the soft palate is falling directly posteriorly, causing obstruction. So you get this kind of a slit or banana shaped appearance of the airway. Uh, some patients have um, this um, concentric circular collapse of the airway, where there's quite a bit of collapse of the side walls and posterior side walls of the, of the pharynx. Um, so Patients with this concentric circular collapse have been shown to not do as well with uh, Inspire therapy or with hypoglossal nerve stimulation therapy and then are excluded from treatment. Uh, during the sleep endoscopy, you all also would look at the uh, pharyngeal and hypopharyngeal airway, the retroglossal airway, but um, for determining indications of uh, implantation, this is really the, the main thing is to see that anterior posterior collapse in the retropodal airway. The device itself has uh, three components to it. There's a uh, stimulating lead which is planted, implanted in the submental region on the uh, terminal branches of the hypoglossal nerve. The pulse generator itself uh, is placed in a pocket on the anterior chest wall, uh, superficial to the pectoralis major muscle. And the sensing lead then is implanted either in the fifth or sixth intercostal space between the external and internal, internal intercostal muscles. Um, the device does have conditional MRI approval, meaning that the patient can undergo extremity MRI, but uh, should not have the device itself in the magnetic field. Uh, the battery in the device has a projected life of 11 years. So for me, the most interesting thing about this slide, um, actually it did get fixed, but the um, um, first step in the procedure is to put in the EMG electrodes both in the um, genioglossus muscle and in the hyoglossus muscle. The hyoglossus muscle is a very strong retractor of the tongue. <clears throat> it's been shown that if you stimulate that muscle, then it does cause retraction of the tongue with um, airway obstruction. So ideally, your, your implanted device won't be causing uh, activation of the hyoglossus muscle. So a dissection um, along the terminal branches um, will reveal the uh, terminal branches going to the hyoglossus muscle and via EMG stimulation, then you can, can sort out which branches you would like to stimulate and those you would like to avoid stimulation. Uh, these are some pictures that, um, that I took um, a few months back during one of my cases. Uh, I recently gave the same lecture to uh, a sleep medicine conference in Alaska. Uh, my wife Terry accompanied me on that and uh, sat through this lecture and um, uh, afterwards critiqued my, my technique and told me I spent way too much time talking about the surgery, but I think it was mainly because I like these slides that I took. Uh, so in the first slide, um, we have done a, about a four and a half centimeter submental incision and exposed the digast entry belly, the digastric, digastric tendon, mylohyoid muscle retracted the digastric inferiorly. Once the mylohyoid is then retracted inferiorly, then exposes the soft tissue, and then in, in there, if you dissect around, you'll find the hypoglossal nerve. Uh, through use of the EMG uh, stimulation and sorting out the fibers, then you can separate out these fibers here going to the hyoglossus from the ones going to the genioglossus and intrinsic muscles of the tongue. Uh, bundle those up with a uh, vessel loop and then place the um, stimulating cuff around those branches. The stimulating cuff is uh, one centimeter in length. It's got three active electrodes in it and then the lead is tunneled underneath the tendon of the digastric and then fixed in place here with um, um, some suture. The um, next step then is the implantation of the, the uh, pulse generator uh, on the chest wall, and then once that's accomplished, then the uh, sensing lead is placed. And so this is a picture here of the lateral chest wall. The serratus muscles have been divided and retracted, exposing the external intercostal muscle here. 
which if you remember from days gone by with basic anatomy, it's the muscle with the fibers that run from, from right to left if you're on the right side. So you divide that muscle, uh, exposing the internal intercostals, which run in the opposite uh, direction, make about a five centimeter pocket, and then put the sensing lead in. And so basically a piezoelectric uh, electrode that's able to detect uh, pressure differential. Wound healing occurs pretty quickly. This is a um, set of photographs taken out about three months post-op, just showing uh, wound healing. And then the, the actual stimulation, the pictures on the left here, retropaudal, or I'm sorry, retroglossal, retropaudal airway, and in a sleep individual with obstructive sleep apnea, and you can get a pretty good idea of the caliber of the airway at each location. With stimulation, then the retroglossal airway opens up quite a bit with the anterior tongue motion, uh, retropaudal airway, good dilatation as well. This uh, set of pictures were taken on an awake individual. Generally, we evaluate these people postoperatively in the office uh, doing an awake endoscopy. Again, the retroglossal airway you can see here with the epiglottis off in the distance and the tongue base with the lymphoid tissue, retropaudal airway here, and then with activation, uh, significant um, improvement in the caliber of the retroglossal airway as well as the retropaudal airway. So what does this feel like to the patient? Uh, they do not get any kind of electrical shock sensation from doing this, but it does feel very strange. The patient basically loses control of their tongue motion. The tongue will move forward um, anteriorly, and you can make it move forward quite vigorously depending on how much voltage you're applying with the device. Uh, most patients adjust to this fairly quickly and uh, are able to sleep through stimulation with the device. There are some patients, of course, who have more difficulty with it and are less tolerant of the stimulation and, and the tongue, tongue motion. The idea is to start them out at fairly low stimulation levels so they can acclimate to it and become used to it and then gradually titrate up until the apnea has been controlled. We do have uh, five-year outcome data on the use of this device, and for any of you who do much or have much uh, experience in treating sleep apnea, there really is not much five-year data available for any form of treatment for obstructive sleep apnea. This group, uh, was Tucker Woodson um, and his group out of um, uh, Wisconsin that published in the American Journal of Otolaryngology, um, had neck surgery in 2018. They had 126 patients in their initial cohort over the five-year period. They lost uh, several patients due to uh, death unrelated cause or withdrawal from therapy or simply lost a follow-up. They ended up with 71 patients that they were able to evaluate with a sleep study at the end of the five-year period. So they reported a, a mean reduction in the um, apnea hypopnea score from a baseline of 32 to 12.4 at the five-year mark. <clears throat> the um, uh, apnea hypopnea, or the mean scores then were reduced by about 60%, and they were stable uh, between one years and five years, indicating that there was really no deterioration in function of the device or, or its efficacy. There wasn't um, any indications of tongue muscle hypertrophy from use or uh, loss of function in the hypoglossal nerve. The other issue or um, significant findings here were that about 44% of the patients were able to get their apnea hypopnea index below five, which would be considered uh, a cure. Uh, we don't see too many uh, cures in doing surgery for obstructive sleep apnea short of doing a tracheostomy or something like that. The um, Incidence of getting the apnea hypopnea index below 15 was about 75%, so uh, pretty highly effective in this group of people. They looked at uh, subjective um, feelings on the part of the patient as far as their daytime alertness were concerned, and both using the upward sleepiness scale and FOSQ, which is another gauge of daytime sleepiness, there was a significant improvement, and the improvement was maintained over five-year period.
Our response rate was um, um, those patients that met the criteria of having a 50% or greater reduction in their uh, apnea hypopnea index and achieved an apnea hypopnea index below 20. So they had 75% of their individuals um, were able to meet those criteria. Snoring was significantly reduced from going from about 80% of patients to about 20% of patients. It's a very busy slide, but that, that's basically what, uh, what they're saying there. Uh, there was uh, another large study with one-year follow-up, and this was uh, published in the European Respiratory Journal. The ADHERE registry is a group of um, mainly academic centers that have done large volumes of implants, and they pooled their patient data, had a total of 507 patients in their study. Uh, they ultimately have the goal to enroll 2,500 patients, but um, published this initial study with 507 patients at one-year follow-up. And they had very similar findings with um, apnea hypopnea index reductions of around 60%, 60 to 70%. So the mean went from 30, what is that, 35, 36 down to 10. And um, similar findings with the EPWARE sleepiness score as well. Patient satisfaction overall is very high with this form of therapy in excess of 90%. Uh, they looked at their post-operative complications. One nice thing uh, with this surgery is we really don't have to disturb the patient's airway. Uh, doing things like UVPPs and tongue-based surgery, there's um, always a significant risk of uh, post-operative airway obstruction and bleeding. Uh, with uh, hypoglossal nerve implants, you're really staying out of the patient's airway. So the main things to watch out for would be post-operative neuropraxia, which should be temporary probably a little higher than what they're saying in this study, but somewhere between two to 5% of patients will have some sensation of tongue weakness or numbness for a period of one to three months post-operatively. Um, they did not report any post-operative wound infections. Um, and the other issues really would be post-operative pain, which uh, would um, could in, impair therapy if the patient finds the therapy painful. The big issue with CPAP is that people tend not to use it. There's about a 40 to 60% dropout rate of patients that are being treated with CPAP, so they looked at maintenance of therapy, which was quite high. The, in each center, they're reporting between 5.6 to, to 6.3 hours of usage per night, uh, which is, um, uh, very acceptable range. So um, that is pretty much the story with the uh, Inspire implant or with hypoglossal nerve therapy. And if you have questions, 